My name is Chris Davis and I have the privilege of pastoring the church that Betty's father helped begin almost 70 years ago. So there's a massive amount of heritage that we celebrate and remember this afternoon. When Alan passed away a few years ago, the conversation that was common to all of us was that when you boiled down what mattered to Alan and Betty, it was faith and family. They were simple people and they valued the right things. So times like these are sorrowful. They are filled with grief and mourning. We have memories that have perhaps been locked away somewhere that flood back in and we have reason to cry. But we also have reason to celebrate a couple who were so well focused and so well directed in their priorities in this afternoon as we remember Betty's life uh, just like Alan, you just think she couldn't be happier right now, right? She's with the Lord, and that's what matters to her. And so with that spirit of celebration of her life and her focus on the Lord and her family, and in that spirit of loss and the sadness that we feel, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin our time. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you are Father. We thank you that you invite us to bring you our whole hearts, the beautiful memories we have of those that we love, the sadness we feel for their departure. And with our sister Betty, the sadness that perhaps we felt for a number of years as we have seen her deteriorate. Lord, we thank you that you invite us, you even command us to bring us your whole, our whole hearts to you. And so I pray that this service this afternoon would be a time of beautiful remembrance of our sister Betty, that all that she meant to us can continue to impact us even in her, pres in her absence, and that you would make us better for it. Lord, as we come to sing, to remember, to hear your word. Would you change us during this time? We pray this through your son, Jesus. Amen. You should have received uh, or seen on the back uh, two hymns on a piece of paper. If you would pull that out and we'll sing those consecutively first in the garden. Stay in the garden with him 
of Christ, our Savior, we have the hope of heaven. Amen. The hope that is fully realized for Betty now. And so the other song we will sing when we all get to heaven. Let's sing this with hope. Sing the wondrous love. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, burn a shadow, not a sigh. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every just one glimpse of him in glory will the toils of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize, onward to the prize before us. Soon his beauty he will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open. We shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. We're here remembering the life of Betty Kinkle, born in Mansfield, Ohio. And when we think about what made up a person's life, what is significant to remember, uh, the numbers tell the story. Seven children, 27 grandchildren, 41 great-grandchildren. Alan and Betty left a tremendous legacy, most of which is sitting right here. And so the bulk of her life will be told this morning or this afternoon by her grandchildren. We'll, in a, after a while, invite 
uh, from Joe's children down to the youngest, invite the grandchildren to come and share their stories, share their remembrances of Grandma Kinkle. And that's the real story to be told this morning. Um, but as long as uh, alongside of Betty's family that meant so much to her was her faith in Jesus. So while we will hear, hear lots of stories about Betty this afternoon, we want to hear about Jesus too, because that's what gives us hope as we remember her. I'm going to be reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If you have an app or an actual book with that in it, you are welcome to join me there. You don't have to. But I'll be reading from this text where Paul is addressing the church where there was a, a season of worry and concern about, as he puts it, those who have fallen asleep. Uh, we're here remembering our sister who has died. And we're talking to each other. We're catching up. We're telling stories. Uh, but we should not go too quickly over the sadness of this loss and to be part of uh, the grieving process, even as we have much to celebrate. Listen to what Paul says about uh, those who have, as he says, fallen asleep. This is 1 Thessalonians 4.13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead... In Christ, like our sister Betty, will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so, in this way, we will always be with the Lord. And then Paul adds, therefore, encourage one another with these words. I love the fact that Paul doesn't tell this congregation not to grieve. And that's a word for us to hear as well. We have so many memories, so many recollections of Betty filling our hearts and our minds. And the message here, just because we have hope, doesn't mean that we don't grieve. It means we don't grieve as those who have no hope. In other words, the call here is to grieve with hope. So what does that mean? How do we grieve with hope? And I think there are three things that Paul says that can help us with that. First, Paul tells us that Jesus died and rose again. What makes death our great enemy is not only that moment when the person physically expires. It's all the things that come before that. It's the decay. It's the dying that leads to the death. For Betty, it was the mental decay that preceded her physical decay. If you spent time with her uh, up until about, I don't know, a year or so ago, you know that even with the Alzheimer's, she was still her amazing, keenly interested in your life slightly worried about the details, <laughs> warm and sweet self. She just operated on a really short loop, right? So being with her, I, I went one time and she sat and, and held my hand and I seriously thought, where, where do I have to pay money for the massage? Because <laughs> I just got a whole hand massage for the last 30 minutes that I've been sitting with this woman. She's like kneading my hand, kneading dough. And she just kept squeezing my hand and asking about my family and asking about the church and asking about, oh, they let you be pastor at Whitten Avenue Bible Church? I, yes, Grandma, I don't know why, but they did let me. And she would keep asking those questions and squeezing. And, and every time I shared something, her eyes would get wide and she was so in the moment, so excited. 
And then, about 90 seconds later, we'd start the whole thing over again. <laughs> when Paul tells us that Jesus died and rose again, this is not the only thing Jesus did about death and decay. Jesus' resurrection was the climax of his proactive attack on all death, all dying, all decay. For three years, he restored withered hands and paralyzed legs. He brought those tormented by demons back into their right mind. He healed diseases and returned the dead to life. Through these mighty deeds, he gave samples of what the great, perfected, final kingdom of God would be like. Like the movie trailer to the feature film, or the hors d'oeuvres to the feast. And he capped off this assault on death, dying and decay, by dying our death, and conquering it by rising from the grave. Jesus died and rose again, and this enables us to grieve with hope. Second, Paul tells us that Jesus' resurrection means our resurrection. That because Jesus died and rose again, we have the same hope. And that allows us, as we grieve the loss of our sister, our grandmother, our mother, our great-grandmother, our friend, that enables us to grieve with hope. Paul says it is since we believe that God will bring deceased believers like Betty back at his return. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul uses different language about this final resurrection like this. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming, this day that Paul's anticipating in 1 Thessalonians, those who belong to Christ. Christ and those who belong to Christ. There's this connected relationship here between Jesus and those who, like Betty, believe in Jesus. It's, it's the natural connection, like the connection between a mother and her nursing child, that whatever she eats, the child eats. It's the connection between the father who's driving the 1959 Chevy Pepto-Bismol colored station wagon with seven kids in it, and the kids who are sitting in that station wagon, that wherever that father drives, the kids are going to go there too. And in the same way, Jesus' destiny of resurrection is not, we don't just have hope because he beat the grave, it's because all who are united to him by faith have that same destiny. We grieve with hope, not just because of Jesus' victory, but because his victory is our victory. Because his resurrection means our resurrection. Because his new body means our new body. So even as we rightfully, and, and I'll just be honest, the time that always gets me is when we start putting the dirt on top of the casket. So I'll just warn you, I'll, I'll be, it'll be dusty in the room then because there's a, a closure that we feel with, with the loss and the death of our dear sister. But even as we grieve around the lifeless body of this beloved mother, grandmother, and friend, she, along with all who are in Christ, will rise. We will see Betty again. Everything that was beautiful and amazing about her, but with a new body, with a new mind. Betty 2.0. That is our hope. That is why we can grieve with hope. Third and finally, we grieve with hope because we will always be with the Lord. Paul says that. We will always be with the Lord. When I've talked to Peter about Betty's failing health, he's communicated what our family felt as our, uh, my grandparents uh, suffered from Alzheimer's, that when they hit the final stretch of that, you're just ready for them to be home, right? They're not themselves. They're not who you remember. They're, they just need to go be with Jesus, right? And the challenges uh, that, that this brings to us is our culture has a way to keep bodies living, 
right? We can medically keep bodies alive for a long time because of our scientific process, but we all know, whether you're a Christian or not, you know that that's not really living, right? That's not what true, life is not just not dying, right? It's not just the extension of physical processes. And in these verses, Paul gives us a definition of what truly living is. He says, we will always be with the Lord. So that even having a resurrected body is not truly living. Knowing Jesus is truly living. And so we grieve with hope this morning because Betty Kinkle right now is not here. She is absent from the body and present with the Lord. She is experiencing in that fullness the eternal life that is knowing Jesus, that she is there now. I mean, aren't you jealous? She's there now with Jesus. Now, who knows what, if she's looking down, she's probably saying, stop making such a fuss about me, right? Who knows what she would be saying? Your grandkids can fill us in on that. But she is with the Lord, and that is eternal life. Paul closes his remarks about this final day when we will be with Jesus forever by saying, therefore, encourage one another with these words. So I do that now. I ask you also to encourage one another with these words. Jesus died and rose again. His resurrection means our resurrection and we will always be with the Lord. Encourage one another with these words. And if you don't trust in Christ this afternoon, please do. Nobody, nobody wants to grieve without hope at your funeral, right? Nobody wants to have to ask those really hard questions when you die. Follow the amazing testimony of this woman and her faith and trust in the Lord. And get, death will not be a gateway into eternal separation, continuing separation from God. Death will be a gateway into always being with the Lord. And for those of us who do trust in Christ, may the fact that we will see Betty again, may this intensify our yearning for that final day when the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. Let us make that day and that Savior our daily hope. May we love his appearing. May we long to be in his presence and allow that day to shape how we live every day in between. Let's pray. Father, hear our hearts. May we grieve with hope. Amen. At this time, we will hear Betty's story through the voices of those who meant so much to her, her grandchildren. And so, uh, beginning with Joe's kids, you guys come on up, and you know who comes next after that. I'll let you take it from there. I don't know exactly what grandma would say right now, but I know that grandpa would say, don't cry, it'll only upset your grandmother. <laughs> we were talking yesterday about all the memories, um, and it, for us it came back again and again to how much of a teacher grandma was. Everything always had a special lesson with it. Everything always had an imaginative lesson with it. And so we kind of came up with a little list of the lessons that grandma taught us. Um, and I'll, I'll in, in no particular order, uh, be a good sport. Play to win, but be a good sport. Be a good winner, be a good loser, but enjoy the, enjoy the game. A good cook always cleans as she goes. <laughs> Plant flowers and take care of your four-legged friends, even <laughs> if they are giant St. Bernard's that drool all over you. 
make believe, whether it's in a playhouse, the farm, whether it's just in the little library in their condo. It was her closet, but it was the library. <laughs> um, whether it was just laying out on the grass at the farm and looking up at the clouds. Or it happened to be George Washington's birthday and you turned off all the lights and only ate by kerosene lamp or candle. <clears throat> Dress with care. Style matters. <laughs> and so does nicely fitting clothes. <laughs> Tell good stories. And never underestimate the power of a book on tape. <laughs> cook well. And if you don't have time to cook, know where to get the best breakfast in town. <laughs> and make something with your hands. She was so brilliant, but she was so creative too, and she knew how to connect the two. Um, it was, and that to me is such a powerful legacy. The, uh, last and maybe greatest lesson I think she taught us at the end, that this flesh is not what holds us. That even the brain, which has such power over who we see ourselves as, it is not who we truly are in him. That the spirit is what defines us and the hope and the love and the faith that comes with that. That is who we are, and that is who she was, and that's what she's left with us. And what a beautiful legacy that is. We're missing one, Rachel, our sister is expecting a baby in a couple weeks, so she's not here, but um, really where do you start um, with such a blessing of who grandma was to us and realizing that you wouldn't be the person that you are without her involvement. She was the light of her house. Um, she made it a magical place. A magical place where we would visit. Um, so many adventures there with her and Grandpa. Uh, Becky was, is the first granddaughter of the family. And in uh, my parents' wisdom and in Grandma and Grandpa's wisdom, they shipped her there on a plane when she was four. Five. Like five. <laughs> Uh, of which grandma got the date wrong on the calendar, right? So she got a call from the airport saying your five-year-old granddaughter is down here. <laughs> so. I'll never forget it. <laughs> uh, is that your treat, Paul? Yeah, they gave me pop, and we didn't drink pop. And it was, and then I watched the show Dallas. <laughs> Waiting for grandma and grandpa to come and get me. It was, it's, a, it's a hilarious memory. But. Yeah, our, she was horrified. <laughs> yeah, horrified. Uh, her involvement in her house, the kitchen, walking around, the jean skirt, high heels sometimes, clicking, making food, all the stories, the musicals, um, Rare Rabbit, Teeny Tiny Women. Um, just wonderful. Uh, one of my fondest memories of Grandma was, I don't know how old I was, six, seven, eight was riding in the car, it was just me and her, and I told her that she had nice legs. <laughs> because they weren't like our family's legs, like spindly, you know? They were hefty. So, Grandma, you have nice legs. And she really laughed really hard at that. And, um, um, Rachel brought up the memory of just her in the barn and doing eggs in the afternoon, her hands flying, multitasking, answering the phone watching the prices right on that little TV. Yeah. The noise of the machines. The freezer. The freezer. Um, I think for me though, 
you look at someone's, you know, see her for such a long time and make such an initial impact on your life. Um, I know for, for Mandy and I, we worked um, in a nursing home where Grandma Ghetto was. And um, just to see Grandma's interaction and caring for Grandma Ghetto, for me, was a big deal. Um, Mandy and I were there uh, when Grandma died, when Grandma Ghetto died. We worked there. And uh, Grandma came in, they called us in after she died. We just got to be the lucky ones to be there. And I remember her telling us how um, happy she was that we could be there in that moment with her. And, um, and also just the sacrifice that she made for her mother all of those years. The trips to the farm, there's Grandma Ghetto. You know, she's disabled, she's had a stroke, and yet Grandma cared for, for her for years and years. And um, that really stood out to me. Just someone who, who was sacrificed, have a good attitude, attitude, do it with a little bit of flair, and just love, love on other people, so. I do, I want to say something too really quick, and that is um, that watching this process with Grandma, she's got seven kids, and um, to all seven of you, you've done really well. I think you're all still friends. <laughs> I know it hasn't been easy, but I think from all your kids, and we just want to thank you for loving our Grandma well, and I know it's been a lot. So we love you. Thanks. I'm not sure if anyone else is going to join me <laughs> up here. I guess the guys will come. I want to thank you guys all for coming. It's really wonderful to see so many uh, friends and family of Grandma. My name is Sarah Voltich. I'm the oldest of Stephen Jill Kinkle's kids. Um, and on behalf of the family, I was going to say a few words of how uh, we experienced Grandma. Grandma was amazing. I've never known another woman like her. She created an environment of comfort, safety, and the feeling that you were home. Grandma loved to read out loud. She loved sharing a good book by reading to us while we worked a puzzle or we ate dessert after dinner. She loved David Copperfield, Little House on the Prairie, Anne of Green Gables. My daughters treasured the tapes that she would make for them reading Gram the Grandma's Attic series. Let me share with you what that atmosphere was like in the form of a story, remembering Grandma. The sun pours through the kitchen window and highlights the blue and white china cup and saucer I've placed on the checkered tablecloth. The steam from the freshly poured coffee spirals up and then disappears as it passes in and out of the white sunbeams. The room is quiet and peaceful and full of warmth from the sun. It is bright here and cheerful and welcoming. There's an old box sitting across from me on the table and I've decided it's time to open it and unpack these sweet memories one last time. I carefully remove the worn lid and reverently set it aside. First, I take out a snow globe of a brick farmhouse with a long chicken barn in the back and a small orange children's playhouse with white trim on the side by the garden. And there's a St. Bernard dog sitting by the front door. The swirling snow settled on the lovely little house and all is still. Next, I pick up a wonderful old book with worn pages from being read so often. The book contains the story of the large family who lived in the lovely brick farmhouse. There were many pictures of this family, and as a child, I loved looking at them and making up stories about their lives and the many adventures they had. The house seemed almost magical. It had two sets of stairs, a play kitchen in the basement, and an upstairs clothes chute that went clear down two stories to the concrete floor in the basement. <laughs> there were chests of dress-up clothes and shoes, games to play and books to read. There was even a real fireplace and it was absolutely magical, and everything was decorated with chickens. <laughs> the next object I find is carefully tucked in the corner of the box, and it's wrapped in gold tissue paper. 
Glitter sprinkles onto the tablecloth and the tissue falls away to reveal a beautiful old Christmas ornament. A sparkling Christmas tree comes to mind, dotted with individual packages holding Christmas cookies to be shared, the nights counting down to Christmas Day. I take up the last object, another book with a worn black cover and yellowed pages from years of studying. It falls open to the familiar chapter in Ephesians 4, the words be kind and tenderhearted are underlined. Kind, that was grandma. Tender-hearted, that was grandma. Grandma was a teacher in many ways. And here are some lessons that I've learned from her, and I didn't talk to Annie before I, before I did this, but these, this is exactly what I wrote too. Um, lesson, the first lesson, be faithful, loyal, and love others. Your behavior demonstrates what you believe. Love the Lord, your family, and those around you. Her prayers on our behalf have sustained many of us through difficult times. Be courageous and brave. Grandma lived apart from her family for many years before joining them in Arizona at the young age of nine. Be kind to others. Grandma took in many young wandering souls over the years. She exemplified Ephesians 4.32 to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Feed them well. One of the most treasured items is a, our well-worn Kinkle cookbook. It was a privilege to eat at her table. Be thoughtful. The gifts she gave were symbolic and meaningful. Be relational. She was highly relational and empathetic, seeking face-to-face -face conversations, caring about how you were really doing. Finally, be creative and resourceful. When we would visit the farm in Colorado as children, she would engage us in the simple pleasures of farm life, picking up the eggs, harvesting fruit and vegetables from the garden. She planned special trips to the museum, the zoo, the amusement park Illiches, and the beloved Casa Bonita. <laughs> she took us to breakfast at the local village inn, and I remember feeling in awe that all the servers welcomed her, and she knew them all by name. In conclusion, Grandma touched so many of our lives, enriching them with an abundance of love. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I saw I'm just going to read it, okay. Um, so, uh, um, I'm Catherine, <laughs> please that's how grandma saw me the past uh, year and a half. Um, <laughs> I've, I've had the opportunity to help take care of Grandma at Sarah's place, and it's been a long ride. Um, I've seen Grandma at different phases of life, it seems like. Um, I've seen her when she was, like, at 16 years old and wasn't sure if she could go to a movie or not. <laughs> and um, I saw her when... There were nights when she would talk about boys with me, and she would just get really young in spirit and young at heart. And um, nights where she was a mother, and nights when she was sad. But every day she, was, she would always care for everyone else. She would make sure that everyone was safe in bed before she would lay in bed. And everyone got their food before she would eat. Um, my family was blessed with memories of Grandma and Grandpa's farm, I think. I didn't get those memories, but I'm sure you guys did. Um, playing Skippo and Grandma's signature snacks. 
Grandma left my family and I with wonderful memories. She took care of that up until the day she met her savior in love at the gates of heaven. She's home now and can finally relax and know that we are all safe and sound and we're all taken care of. And that's it. Did you guys have anything? <laughs> all set to not cry before all this started. <laughs> so we met and discussed a bunch this morning and uh, we talked about a lot but some of the things that uh, stood out were grandma's strength and determination. Um, the way she would overcome obstacles. Uh, and I think one of the great examples of that are the tapes to overcome uh, her family being spread out and her not being with them and, and her love for her grandchildren. She read these books and they became the staple of our childhood. Um, so much so that the girls could, uh, I think, lip sync uh, to grandma reading. <laughs> I think I heard that that infuriated her when she tried to read to them at the house. <laughs> but even years later when uh, Mary was in Macedonia and alone and needing comfort listening to grandma's tapes. Really gave her that. <clears throat> All right, also her adventurous spirit and the books that she loved. Uh, a couple examples were I Married Adventure uh, and uh, The Woman Who Wasn't Afraid of Anything, which I believe she read to all of the granddaughters. Um, and uh, one of Stephen's best memories was a, a picnic that grandma had made for him and her up in the mountains to make, <clears throat> to make sure uh, that he had, uh, he got to go see the beautiful view and was reminded to go experience life. Uh, and then also, the fall leaves in the Midwest. Uh, she loved it, she would come out. She was so excited to see uh, fall in Ohio every time she came to visit. And then obviously, uh, her connection and love for her grandchildren and her family. Um, my, one of my memories is reading uh, Sunday comics on the floor in her bedroom and her coming in and uh, and being so excited that I was doing that and, and telling me how she learned to read by reading comics. And she got down on the floor on her elbows and just read with me and told me the stories. Um, and my boys, my little five-year-old boys, wanted to make sure that uh, I told you that she had wheeled them around on her walker. So it was just, just, she could barely get out of the chair, but as soon as they were there, she got them up and took them for a ride. And those are those are some of our memories. I'm Abigail Mills, and I've been elected to speak for my siblings. <laughs> um, we also uh, kind of collected our, our different thoughts and impressions, so I'm going to share from all of them. Um, the very first time that I walked into a courtroom, <laughs> sorry, I can't talk and cry at the same time. I just don't have that ability. <laughs> The first time I walked into a courtroom was with Grandma as my guide. Annie and Jessica were visiting from Colorado and Grandma took us out for a day downtown, including a visit to the courthouse. I remember being really apprehensive as she opened the door to the courtroom and ushered us into the back seats of some stranger's hearing. Um, I wasn't sure we were allowed in, but Grandma didn't hesitate. She was alight with intellectual curiosity and excitement. But that was Grandma. She was so smart and capable. Without ever being overbearing or arrogant, she taught us the importance of an education. I brought it with me, but she uh, gave me her National Honor Society pin that she earned in uh, 1945. She was an excellent scholar. A day with her meant discovering, uh, whether at a museum, a courthouse, or a historical site, she read us books, but she also narrated for us the world around her. Through her eyes, we saw a wealth of history, the adventure of it, and the value of knowing both where you came from and where you were going. Erica pointed out that she never seemed discontent. She found the world fascinating. 
beautiful. She loved exploring its people and their ways of life, whether it was Amish country in Ohio or listening to one of her grandkids tell of their adventures overseas. She truly was a pioneer, the kind that settled the Wild West with grace. When I studied in Russia for a semester, I kept a journal both of my amazing experiences and what I was learning and also uh, just really raw, honest, ugly things that I was struggling with at that time. And when I came back, I gave the journal to Grandma. She was the only person to read it. She graciously stepped inside a vulnerable place that I knew was safe to share with her. Her only response was to thank me for showing her the honest heart of a woman abroad. But again, that was Grandma. As Xander simply and aptly said, Grandma was a safe place. To Mandy, she embodied unconditional love, a grandma who seemed to enjoy us as much as we enjoyed her. She had a large family, but there was always one-on-one -on -one time with each of her grandkids. Mandy said that when she was little, her dream was to grow up and be a grandma on a farm. <laughs> As the oldest in her family, Mandy also got to experience the blessing of her kids, being able to know grandma. Grandma invested and poured in her heart into each of her grandchildren and great-grandchildren, carving apples like little pumpkins, baking cookies, bird feeding and watching, going on walks in her neighborhood, and of course, reading to them. Mandy said, I miss her deeply, and I still want to grow up to be a grandma like her someday. I feel the same way. Grandma was classy, a lady to the core. I never heard her talk negatively about anybody. Erica observed how she never indulged in complaints or excuses, but she also never pushed you to be someone that you weren't or discounted your feelings. In Erica's words, she believed in me and patiently held me accountable to that potential, and I dearly loved her for it. And Grandma loved to banter. No joke or witty remark went over her head, and she always had one in reply. When I think of her, the image that comes to mind is her squeezing my hand and biting her tongue in laughter. It was fun to make Grandma laugh. Being Betty's grandchild was an identity, one in which we all take a lot of pride. And most importantly, Grandma loved Jesus. I love the story of how she broke off her first engagement to Grandpa. She told, she told me it was either marry him or follow God because he was not a believer at the time. She sat down and had to decide what her life was going to be about. And it was hard, but she wanted to follow God with all of her heart. Grandpa left saying he never wanted to see her again. But of course, God eventually got a hold of Grandpa, who then decided to go on a road trip visiting and preaching in various churches with some of his buddies. Grandma heard he was coming and escaped to Ohio for the weekend that he was going to be there so she wouldn't have to see him. But unknowingly, Grandpa got delayed in the church before Phoenix. So she got back to Phoenix just in time for him to arrive. <laughs> Three days later, they were engaged a second time. The love they seemed to share, or the love they shared seemed to grow sweeter with time, till at the end of their life together, they glowed with it, smiling and flirting like two teenagers. I was talking to Aunt Mary last night about how strange it is that after many, many years on this planet, how wrong death still feels for us humans. Even when it comes at the end of a long, full life, and as a relief from a hard illness, grandma and death just don't fit together well. Of course, it is true that man has fallen, that we were not made for death. But for grandma, I believe that incongruity is even more pronounced because of her walk with Jesus, the way God shined through her in a life that was so full and noble and right. I remember her and I see that God is real. And that grandma's kind of life, Jesus living through her, is eternal. Although her body has failed, she has not been extinguished. She is now more alive than ever before. I will totally have to stick to a script. It's a room full of people who are now genetically disposed to fits of weeping. <laughs> One of the many legacies that Grandma and Grandpa left us with. Grandma left a legacy to her family 
and to her children. What Grandma gave was a legacy of deep appreciation for education, especially for history. She would talk frequently about her time at the Creighton School District and at Creighton School and about how nice of a man Principal Mackin was and how he always wore such a nice clean white suit. <laughs> or her years at Phoenix Union High School. She gave a legacy of stories, it's probably the one most of us uh, remember best, of being a storyteller, of being a story hearer, reading many books to her grandchildren, either in person or through a cassette tape. She was herself a story maker, telling of moving across the country, whether it's in Ohio or Arizona or elsewhere, Mansfield or Culver Street, talked about the great adventure of chicken farming and following Grandpa out there and going on that adventure together. Grandma gave a legacy of family. For more than half of my life, we spent every Tuesday night, we did as a family over there with Grandma, uh, with Greg, Ashley, my mother and father, our dinners every Tuesday night. And even when she wasn't here in Phoenix when we were very young in person, uh, she was here in another capacity, reading to us, sending us the cassette tapes that almost all of us have mentioned. She was also sending us letters and notes, and I remember being really excited and confused about what a, a little treasury note was or a bond was at that time. And she was always present. I, I think everyone could attest to this. You, you felt like you were maybe her only grandchild. Like you, you totally just had that feeling from her. She was present in our lives, and there were many of us to be present in, but she was. Even when she wasn't physically here, she was present with all of us. She gave us a legacy of faithfulness to the Lord. I spoke with Grandma uh, shortly after I became engaged to Katie, and her number one question for me, or only question really, was, does she love the Lord? And that's what governed, I think, all of her decisions, and almost all of her concerns was, do I, do we love the Lord? She was a teacher in the church. She was faithful to nurture the hearts of many children, many who were not her own, as well as her own. And I truly believe that Grandma's greatest joy and Grandpa's in life was the salvation of their posterity. I think she cared very much for the souls of all of her children. And that was a legacy that she gave my family. How she gave that legacy for me is kind of quintessential to my understanding of who she is. She was so hospitable and so kind and so gentle, so concerned for others, so concerned always for the people that she loved. In the last few years, our family was able to kind of keep that tradition alive of going out and seeing her on Tuesdays. And as grandma's world got smaller and foggier, that deep concern for the people that she loved, it seemed like it would get amplified uh, every time we went out to see her. And her faithfulness to Christ was also manifested and amplified during that season, the season that was hard for everybody. Um, and I noticed that when we'd go and even when there was a harder night and anxiety would be kind of peaked and you could see there was so much concern. Um, reading, just like she read to so many of us for so many years through tapes or in person, reading God's word with grandma brought grandma peace and assurance and it's usually a, an unnaturally strong squeeze of your hand. And we can rejoice now not because Grandma's no longer suffering, which she's not, and not because she lived a good life, which she did, not because she raised and impacted generations of her family and other people, which she certainly did, but because her glory is just beginning now. And we're celebrating the life of Grandma, but we're not celebrating the life that she had 
but we're celebrating the life that she has. She did not, and we do not believe in a fuzzy, gnomic end of suffering and the great beyond. She certainly does live on, not just in her stories and in her hearts, which she does, but she literally, physically, really lives on right now with her Savior, our firm hope and our foundation realized fully for her right now. And over the last year, those anxious questions that would come more frequently when we would come and visit were almost always related to, I'm not where I'm supposed to be. I've got to get home. And sometimes home was Manfield. Sometimes it was Culver Street. Sometimes it was the farm. You never knew. And I remember one night driving back with Uncle Joe and Aunt Kim in the car and we were wondering, I wonder if Grandma was physically at any of those locations that used to be home for her, if, if she would feel at home. And the consensus was at that point, no, I don't think anywhere she would have been, she would have felt at home. And just in a little bit of reflection, I think Grandma maybe surreptitiously had much more wisdom than we did. And I think she was right. That no matter where she would have been, she was not home. And that anxiety, one of her chiefest anxieties, being home, being in the right place, we know now is fully permanently and perfectly put to rest. Not Mansfield Street or Culver Street or anywhere else, but she is at home. She's with the Lord now. What a legacy. Amen? What a legacy. I hope these stories spawn hours and hours of conversation as we remember this amazing woman and as we allow her life to continue to impact ours in her absence. This will bring this part of our uh, service to a close and I'll invite Gary to come up and uh, give us instructions for how we will shift now over to the graveside to say goodbye.
gentlemen, once again, thank you so much for being here to support the family. I know they appreciate that. Uh, this will conclude the services at this point.